Uh, it's not been particularly easy to figure out exactly what kind of content to make, because this game is not... It's... It's an oversimplification to say that the game is not very tech-heavy, but it's just kind of like... A lot of the tech ends up in the same positions, you know? Any meaty setup that you do is like, okay, well, the risk of the rotation of options is still relatively similar. It's DP, it's perfect parry, it's whatever, so... A lot of the, you know, quote-unquote tech just comes from finding optimizations, damage optimizations in, in certain situations. And then a lot of the other tech is more abstract and harder to prove, like... The exact right, like, where to spend meter... Which sequences are good for meter, etc. So... In which, there's not even really a consensus on your strategy surrounding your resource management in the first place, so it's hard to call anything tech with regards to that. Except for the glitches. A lot of game-breaking glitches uh, being found recently. But anyways, we've been talking about uh, Ken and Luke, so I thought I would just, in a technical sense, cover the, um, cover the bases, cover what's going on. So first things first, uh, let's go over let's go over Ken because he's much simpler. Ken's obvious strengths are, um, I think his walk speed's better. I actually don't know, but I'm sure his his walk speed's better in terms of just the actual neutral. Fireball is worse significantly. Ex fireball is good in counter zoning because it yields a huge reward when it clashes with a fireball because it, it, it lets him drive rush behind it. That being said, it does have certain limitations. It's really strong when used and it works for that application, however, it does have some limitations. He also has just light fireball drive rush as an approach. But all of these things that he can utilize his fireball for are things that he can only do from, like, way back here. It's, it's, whereas, like, Luke's EX fireball is very good for counter zoning, and he can use it anywhere on screen. That being said, it doesn't yield quite the same reward, but Ken's only yields reward in this one particular space, etc. Anyways. And that's the thing, is that his light fireball lets him get reward automatically, but it's only a light fireball. It doesn't win against other zoning characters, and the opponent has other options, and they can prevent him from getting to that space in the first place. It requires a long setup. The EX one yields a combo, but only if it clashes with a fireball. It has to clash with a normal fireball to slow it down first, otherwise you don't get a conversion. Except for something like that, which is nothing. But anyways, Ken's primary strengths in terms of footsies, his low forward, incredibly good. Seven frame startup, so faster than Luke's. And uh, just kind of a ridiculous button. Very, extremely good low forward. Its hurt box is slightly worse than Luke's, but um, its hitbox and functionality is much better, much more lethal. Very difficult low to deal with, with his walk speed, movement speed, drive rush, and its range and speed. Uh, his standing medium kick, not talked about as much, but incredibly useful. Um, he would be he would be worse if he did not have this button. You don't use it all the time, and he has so many other things he can go for. But in the situations where it's good, it is very helpful to have this button. There are very few moves in this game that hit as far as this thing does for 8 frames. Very few 8-framers reach this far. This move can punish things. Almost no other member of the cast can punish, etc. without spending a super or something. Um, this move hits in ways where, let's say the opponent, um, like, uh, okay, so let's say you have, like, a situation where an opponent, I'll put it on block, a situation where a certain character, so JP has, like, these light string sequences and stuff, and, uh, he usually, he generally only has one special he can go into. He could go into a, a projectile, but, um, there's a gigantic gap if he does that. So he usually has this. This is generally pretty safe on block most of the time. Uh, it depends on the character, what resources they have. 
but it also does lose to DI if they predict it. However, if he's if he just keeps it like this and doesn't cancel it into anything else, the only way for him to win against DIs is for him to sit there and wait for it, or to... He's still in range for their low forward when he's right here, so if he tries to walk back, depending on the character, like Ken especially, would be able to hit him with a low forward. So, it is generally useful for characters like this that don't have necessarily a way to push out of range, because some characters can do very safe block strings that push the opponent entirely away from them and are no longer in range of normals and just go back to footsies. I've mentioned this in some of my other videos. Whereas other characters have like defensive options, like Blanca would be able to do jump back EX airball and such in these situations, so he has something that makes it threatening for the opponent to not press buttons there. JP and a lot of characters jump back is very strong. Neutral jump or jump back in these situations will get you out of the range of these attacks, will get you out of the range of lows, etc. Um, the point is, standing medium kick can clip people jumping backwards in situations where most characters can't. So in this situation, as Ryu has nothing that will clip her jumping backwards in this situation, can standing medium kick one of the few buttons that does? I'm mistiming it. So, yeah, this standing medium kick, very strong uh, for punishing certain things, very strong move in general, single hit confirmable into a target combo, um, very under-talked about move. Extremely useful, though. Standing heavy punch, ridiculous move, little slow, 10 frames start up, but... Uh, ridiculous active frames, ridiculous recovery after the... What the fuck? Um, and single hit confirmable as well, so, just, uh, god but Ryu and Ken both have very similar stand fierces, but Ken's is a bit better. Then you have Sweep. Ken's is incredibly good, one of the fastest in the game at 8 frames, and reaches very far. Not quite as far as Ryu's, but, um, minus 10 at around this range. Uh, its speed plus its range, um, makes it, uh, you know incredibly good at whiff punishing in situations where most characters struggle and it's just an incredibly useful additional tool to have. Obviously it only gets a knockdown so he doesn't rely on it all the time but again he would be weaker if he did not have it so this is very strong. And then his stand roundhouse ridiculous button absurd range um, with absurd reward as a whiff punish as well so this also incredibly strong. And it's only like it's only like, 38 frames is not as much as you would expect for moves that reach this far. Like, if Lily did her forward heavy punch, it would not reach as far, and it has significantly more recovery. Uh, right, so that's most it. He has a fireball, which, you know, not the best fireball, but it would be he'd be weaker if he didn't have it. And then he has his run option. So particularly in his footsies he has run kick, minus four. Some characters cannot punish it. Lily cannot punish this because her four framer just flat out doesn't reach far enough. No matter how you space it. Uh, incredibly strong move to occupy that space. And it yields reward on counter hit. Uh, one thing, not necessarily not talked about, but people just don't know about, I, d I think, uh, EX Tatsu. If Zangief does, like, let's say record, um, and he's outside the range of sweep to punish it, he can still punish with EX Tatsu. EX Tatsu is the furthest reaching sweep punish thing in the game that's not a super. It's hitbox, it, it is impossible to overstate how far it hits in 9 frames. So, little known thing, useful in certain situations. People aren't even using this because they don't even know about it, but he has that too. His uh, stand light kick, his 5-framer, reaches very far. 
his crouch jab, his four framers are, you know, they're good. I mean, they're, they're about as good as most other characters, particularly his crouch jab. A lot of characters are not necessarily very good at stopping just, um... Okay, here's the thing about this game is that, uh, it's very difficult to walk for at your opponent because you risk running into... Okay, like if we're talking about Luke... It's very difficult to risk walking at Luke, or for Luke to walk at Ken, or any of these strong characters to walk at each other, because if Luke's playing footsies and he tries to walk in for a throw... And he just walks into a limb that they're just automatically canceling into... And that's the thing, is that... These drive rush cancels don't need to be confirmed, and a lot of the times they aren't confirmable. The 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 players are just doing them, and they're plus on block. They they win neutral on block. Players would obviously, in most situations, or in at least a lot of situations, rather be able to hit confirm them. They would rather not waste like spend the three bars on block. But the point is that they get significant reward either way. If it's on block, they instantly win neutral and get a mix up. If it's on hit, they get enormous reward. So there's every incentive for them to just throw out these buttons, which means that unlike in Street Fighter V, where you would either look for like, like if let's say Ken in Street Fighter V at the late end of Street Fighter V, you would risk walking into a low forward, and then he would try to hit confirm that into an uppercut, and that's the risk that you take. Which, to be fair, was strong. Ken was strong by the end of Street Fighter V. So that's like the actual risk that you're taking, or if you try to, like, dash in on him, but he sticks at a jab, he'd be able to, like, confirm it. Now, a lot of characters aren't very good at doing that in this game, but Ken is one of the few, because his crouch jab, his four-framer, is actually plus five on hit, which means he can go into his much longer-range five-frame light, and then still get a, a, a good knockdown. So, he's much better at checking forward movement and forward dashes without having to spend meter. That's the, the uh, a core idea of what, what um, one of the main things that separates Ken from Luke is that Ken does has so many ways of not needing to spend meter. So Ken players, a lot of Ken players, the strong Ken players right now, they will just do low forward into, there's a bit of an awkward range where if both players are like at this distance, Neither one of them wants to walk backwards into neutral. Neither one of them wants to walk into playing the mid-range again. Because if you start walking backwards and the other person does low forward dry rush at that moment, you you die. You just take a combo and you get put in the corner. So no one... You're just sitting there. Nobody wants to fucking walk backwards, so nobody moves or does anything until one of them just hits low forward dry rush. You see this happen all the time. They don't sit there for that long because there's not much incentive in being patient in this game. But, yeah, they'll be in this range, and then they're not going to walk backwards, they're not going to fucking do whatever, they're going to hit fucking low forward drive rush. And one thing is that some characters, if you've played this game, depending on which character you play, but if you've played this game, you know that when you're in the corner and the opponent is encroaching upon you, it's difficult to figure out what buttons to press without spending meter, right? So if the opponent's like that far away from you or whatever. Because all the buttons in this game are most of the buttons in this game are negative on block, unlike in Street Fighter V where you could press buttons that... Okay, one, all the buttons are negative on block in this game and they don't have very much pushback. See, in Street Fighter V, you could do pokes. You could, you could, you could poke at the opponent. Like, you could say, do a standing medium kick or something. Not necessarily with Ken, but like, say, Karen, you would do standing medium kick and you would push them back decently. In this game, buttons are negative and they have very little pushback. So, if you hit your low forward here, minus six, no pushback. Your fireballs suck ass. So, you know, a lot of characters that don't have a safe on block special to cancel into, this is just it. They have, they have a button and they don't want to have the button just be blocked and then go back to being negative uh, in range of the opponent's buttons. So, 
tons of the time when people are have their space encroached upon, they feel this need, even if they don't want to, they feel this need to hit their button into Drive Rush, even if they don't want to spend that much meter. Now, Ken... Ken will do this. Obviously, Ken players will do this all the time. And the way... The speed at which the game plays, a lot of the times... A lot of the times, players, if they were to look back at their matches... Like, there'd be an instance where maybe they did just low forward drive rush, no confirm, no looking for it, no buffer, just do it. And they might look back at their matches and say, oh, if I had thought that through, I probably wouldn't have done that. I probably would have done something else because they, like, they weren't looking at their meter, they burned themselves out, or they got close to burning themselves out, or just wasn't worth it in the long run. So there are instances where you accidentally make bad decisions because you don't have that much time to think through the nuances of how you're spending all your resources a lot of the time. But Ken has this great fucking thing where he has this... It's a bit more complicated than saying it's just safe on block, but he has this pseudo safe on block hit confirmable Rekka series that he can just do. So he doesn't need to just do low forward drive rush, he has a meterless way to check the walk back as well, or to just check the opponent in this space, and he has lots of weird options off of it as well. So that is one separating factor. Luke, by uh, comparison, for on this particular point, Luke has... Luke has three things that really affect this. One, he has, um... He doesn't have, like, he can't just do low forward into a special that gets a knockdown on hit and is safe on block. Unless he spends meter. He would have to do, like, EX Fireball or something. Which most loot players are not going to do. Should they? Probably not, but I don't know. However, there's three things that affect his ability to, like, hit a move that is good for this space. Because when you're at this space... You don't, your four framers don't reach, generally. If, if you're playing in this space, your four framers don't reach, so it's not worth it to press a jab. Not only that, almost all four frame moves, almost all light buttons in this game are fucking awful at playing, at playing like footsies. They're really bad. They have terrible hurt boxes on startup and recovery. They are just the most god awful hurt boxes known to man on all of these four framers from almost every character. Five framers, same story. These these moves, they would be good if you could buffer them freely into Drive Rush, but since they remove that, they're not worth doing in neutral, even buffering them into other specials, because their hurt boxes are just so fucking bad that it's worth it to just do your slower medium buttons that actually do reach it, because these are the only things that are... They're just better overall. They're, you're taking less risk by just using your mediums in these ranges instead of using your lights. So, that's why, when you're in these ranges, uh, Luke having access to a fairly decent fireball is handy. It's handy for him to have something to buffer into, although it doesn't get a knockdown like, like Ken's would if he catches you with Jinrai. But, Luke has also this target combo. Rarely used, but this is a factor if you really wanted to consider the characters. This is single hit confirmable. Now, it's not so easily single hit confirmable. Like, the the, the power of low forward drive rush or low forward Jinrai is that it's so fucking brain dead a monkey could do it without having to put in any effort or skill or focus at all. And that's really what you want out of the situation, because... You don't want to have to... In the speed and situations that you're going to have to do these emergency panic moves in, you don't want to have to look for precise hit confirms. But this is single hit confirmable. It's not that hard to hit confirm. And, um, but that being said, it's just not that rewarding in terms of damage and in terms of the fact that you're only plus one afterwards and not even plus two. But it is a thing that you can do to look for, you know, getting more reward off of something without having to just go back to... But you you will still be minus on block afterwards. Now, he has other things that he can go into if he doesn't just want to be minus on block in case it's blocked. 
Usually you'll probably see Fireball if they just want to create space. He has he has heavy knuckle, although if he overuses this too much, it has more consistent answers than some other moves in the game. But also, in addition to low forward in this range, he has Crouch Strong. Now, the main difference that makes Crouch Strong different, not only is it a great button with a great hurt box, ridiculous recovery, fucking 21 frames in total for an incredibly strong 6 frame medium. But, um, not only is it just a great button in general, but also it's plus on block, so you don't have to have the same thing of like, oh, the opponent's walking towards me, I want to hit a medium to stop them, but I don't want them to block it and then be minus. Uh, you don't have to be minus with this button, you're fucking plus. So, that's one thing that, that alters that factor, is that he is one of the very few plus buttons in the game that he can use to stop people from just walking in on him. And two, at the same range, he also has Stand Jab. Which, on its own, is a uh, special cancelable, so it has some weird stuff you can do like that. And it goes into a target combo, which you can confirm it on block into whatever you want to on block. And it also has weird options, because you can DP the ender, unless it's like, drive rush into that, and then you keep it a true block string. But, in many ways, this jab target combo I feel is underutilized by the Luke players because if you're just going to do like low forward drive rush anyways stand jab doesn't hit low but it gives you more hits to confirm so you don't have to go into drive rush if you see that you got the hit and also it builds you more meter the three hits of the target combo take more time and thus builds you more drive gauge before you do anything afterwards and you still have other options that you can do like, canceling into that, or if you think that they're going to DP, you can fucking hard read it. And DI. So, lots of weird options. Alright, back to Ken. So yes, Ken's Jinrai, not only just as annoying as it is to deal with Jinrai, but also, just him having this thing that lets him throw out these moves and then confirm them into... He can confirm that they're standing, he can get a knockdown with Oki if he drive rushes afterwards, or if he does... whatever. If he, if he does run, kick. So yeah, confirmable. If he sees they're crouching, he can still confirm it into this situation, and then he's plus three, which means that he can... Just do low forward into fucking Jinrai or Dry Brush again. So yes, Jinrai very strong. Just as a as utility for how he can do it off of his medium specials. In uh in the footsies or in this awkward space when neither character has a clear frame advantage. Other thing that affects Ken's neutral. Both Ken, Ken and Luke have these ridiculous jumping fierces. I think I think I would say that Luke's jump is slightly better. Like Ken has EX Tatsu, which is ridiculous, but um, its ridiculousness is a bit conditional and understated because a lot of the times it doesn't hit deep enough for you to get a combo afterwards. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But when it when it hits ridiculously, it hits particularly ridiculously. But yes, um Luke has Luke's jump has uh He has jump fierce, which is absurd. He has jump this, which make can make DPs with. And his jump roundhouse is generally middle ground and, like, better than Ken's jump roundhouse. Other things that affect their footsies, um, in terms of the, uh, their immediate drive rush, Ken's drive rush four-framer, immediate stand jab, very strong in this range. When he's further away, his drive rush gets slightly less strong, but he does have, he does have a multitude of strong options that are sometimes underutilized. Like, this move is ridiculous. So, in general, you have drive rush moves that you do to, like, just play footsies. 
So you do like drive rush jab, not necessarily because it immediately gets you into throw range, but just because it occupies space and is a really good button for its speed, right? Like it hits super far, super fast. And has plus on block and all these things. Now it's not worth it in these ranges to do these medium kicks because they're not plus on block. Unless you then immediately cancel them into Jin right. or Drive Rush or uh, Heavy Dragon Lash. His medium punches, I don't think they're particularly good for Drive Rushing in this capacity. They don't yield the same reward and they're not quite the, quite the same. It's mostly, you'll see... Drive rush stand jab, drive rush low forward just for the low, and drive rush fierce for the for the plus frames. And the uh, the big damage confirm if it hits. Overall, pretty simple drive rush. He also has, you'll see little tricks. He'll slightly halt his momentum by doing drive rush um, heavy dragon lash uh, to catch a slight stutter in his forward momentum. And um, also throw them off of being able to react to the Dragon Lash because they, they get Whiplash from the Dry Rush being cancelled. Um, under... I won't say underutilized because even I don't think this is like necessarily very good in its current state. But if you wanted to, theoretically, Ken does have another technique... So sometimes if the Ken player, you know, like Ken's generally going to do Drive Rush and then if you're really looking for it, you can, uh, you can interrupt it. Oh, wait, no. However, Ken also has a uh, Drive Rush Light Jinrai. Which is, does have that sort of pullback hurtbox effect where any button that they stick out generally loses. Any, like, immediate fast button that they stick out. That being said, if they stick at a crouching button, which many of them will, you don't get a knockdown off of this. It's not like, okay, like if I demonstrate how this looks. It's not plus enough to go into the overhead, so and it's generally too far away to do the light follow-up. And uh, it's plus five, but it's not close enough to do anything, so... He doesn't have, like, great options off of it in its current state. It's just another thing that you can do. It's kind of difficult to do and not worth... Not worth going for, in my opinion. But he can do it. By comparison, uh, looking at Luke's neutral again... I guess we didn't go over his um, footsies buttons, so I guess if we're just doing this play-by-play. -play. Luke's footsies buttons, his low forward um, doesn't reach as far and it's not as fast as Ken's, but it has a better hurt box. It's kind of hard for me to demonstrate this because I don't remember a situation that I can exactly recreate, but it does have a better hurt box on startup. Um, it's good. It's completely good. It's perfectly powerful and stuff. Uh, his standing medium punch is okay. It's not... It's useful in certain situations. It's useful for confirming certain hits. Not necessarily as a, as a footsies button in and of itself, but when you land this, that's good. It is also single hit confirmable, both into super and into the rest of the target combo. That being said, it's minus three on block and uh, does not have like very potent pushback. So you're generally, when this is blocked, you're generally at the mercy of whatever the opponent takes their turn with afterwards. His standing medium kick, however, great poke. Actually, a lot of pushback on block. Um, seven frames, so huge range for poke. Um... Great recovery, only weakness is that it's just a poke, no reward. But, very good poke. Stand Fierce. Great thing to occupy space. 
uh, really far reaching, good for whiff punishes, where you're confident. You need to be confident to use this, because if it whiffs, um, you're moving yourself closer and there's a lot of recovery. Standing heavy kick, occasionally, it's good if it, like, its active frames catch counter hits in, like, this space, but it's quite difficult to space it in ways that are safe or plus or zero on block. It's matchup dependent, but it is a useful thing to have. Luke's fireball, fantastic. Uh, great fireball, much better than Ken's for neutral. EX fireball, absolutely ridiculous, ridiculous move. He can just completely put the kibosh on projectile use from other characters, both with this and with his level one. If I were to put three, th like two things that Luke does that are tools that you can't even compare to something Ken does because they are so unique to Luke and he's the only one that can do anything like them. It would be Suppressor and his level one. There is nothing, there is no compare to being able to shut down projectiles as hard as his level one does. But anyways, yes. The main thing is that... Here's how I would describe these characters. I would say Ken... You have to go in, you have to go in, you have perfectly fine footsies, you don't struggle by getting rushed down, you can poke out, you have tons of great tools, meterless tools, you, you, you have tons of ways of not letting the opponent bully your meter, bully your positioning, you have great DP, whatever, you have all these great options, with punish options, whatever, and then your win conditions are getting the hits and then... Converting them into the corner. And then just abusing the most fucking unfair strike throw corner situation over and over again. The, the vortex in the corner. So his strengths come from any hit takes you to the corner. His corner damage is very high. His mid-screen damage is like whatever. But his corner damage is extremely high. He gets fucking side switches off of everything. Uh, Oki off of his level 1, which is absurd. And it's very easy to go into his supers and his level 3 and stuff to like, get back your, get back your meter, get back your resources. Plus 15? on the knockdown after your level 3, so you can just drive rush in, go for more pressure. It's really strong. Now, in terms of his rushdown, because he can... Ken can, like, uh... All he really needs is get, like, a dash up low forward drive rush. That being said, he obviously doesn't want to have to rely on that all the time to play his neutral and get in. Because you don't want to have to constantly be spending three bars, especially if the opponent's just going to sit there and block it. And just for your, your, just for your throw. Now, if you can get to the corner and you can start opening them up, your meter situation doesn't matter. You can spend four bars, and so long as you keep... They keep guessing wrong, you keep guessing right, you just get all your meter back. That being said, there is a gambly element to this. This is, would be my assessment of the two characters, that I think Ken is a bit more gambly in some ways, because he's very reliant on... He's more reliant on doing unconfirmable moves into Drive Rush, which means he's gambling with how much value, how much reward he's getting out of his meter he's spending, out of his Drive Gauge. And the fact that his win condition is so heavily, like, corner, oaky focused means that he's also gambling on every single one of these situations. Because whenever you're looping offense in the corner, you're gambling on the opponent doing a perfect parry on their wake up or against one of your frame traps. You're gambling on the opponent backdashing your throw and getting a punish counter. Some characters get more reward than others. Or have better backdashes than others. You're gambling on if you go for a throw and the opponent just holds up forwards, sure you can uppercut them, but they still get out of the corner. So when and you're gambling on DPs and wake up supers and stuff. Uh, against other characters like Jury, 
whenever you throw, you're gambling on uh, her doing jump medium punch or Chun Li doing uh, instant air legs, etc. So every time you go for any Oki in this game, you're gambling a lot more than you were in Street Fighter V. Especially in a game where if you go for Oki and the opponent does their wake up DP, they get fucking Oki off that. They get Oki off their DP, and then I like as Ken. Here, let me turn off this refill shit. As Ken, I spent two bars on that. One bar on the dry brush. Landed the hit. Landed the, the meaty. And then I'm here, and I've already built back a whole drive gauge just because of the combo I got from my meaty. And so long as they guess wrong on whatever I do next, I just build back another drive gauge, and it's like I didn't even spend anything on the EXDP. So, yes, Getting DP'd costs three bars, which you might say costs the same as it did in Street Fighter V, because in five you had three bars a meter, and in this you have six, but it costs two, so it's the same. It's one-third of your total meter. But in this, it's just no compare, because if their EXDP translates into Oki and then opening the opponent up, or at least controlling the offense, so long as they continue to pressure the opponent, a successful EXDP might as well not cost anything if it leads to a situation if it, if it doesn't lead to a situation where them spending those two drive gauges actually harms them in some way there's a lot of ways of like if you're an offensive aggressive character you can find yourself in a situation where um no matter how much drive gauge you spent it's fine so long as uh you're still in control, you're still doing whatever you want, your drive gauge keeps regening back like crazy. Aggressive characters have this when they're looping their offense and they keep opening up or controlling the opponent and not having to block anything. And zoning characters get to overspend on their meter because so long as they stay really far away from the opponent and never have to block anything, they can just keep regening their, uh, their meter, throwing their projectiles or Telsum's limbs or whatever. It's only characters in the middle, in the mid in the mid range who like uh, like characters that can't just force their way in all the time, or characters can't force them to be apart all the time, like uh, my character Lily. Right? If you're low on meter, if you have like one bar of meter left with Lily, and you're just in neutral, it's a much worse 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 situation than if you were a Ken or a Dalsim, because Ken can just keep going in, and Dalsim can keep staying back, and if they are successful in their efforts, they can just re get back their meter anyways. So, in some ways, yes. I think there's an element of gambliness to having your win condition be overly reliant on, like, the corner situation. Especially just the corner itself. L not even talking about, the, like, the guess that you take on Oki even in mid-screen. But just the existence of the corner, if you make a slight mistake, let's not even talk about like guessing correctly. Let's say you go for a meaty and you mistime it and the opponent does a wake up jab and they get a counter hit and they combo you and put you back in the in the corner, right? Or just if they perfect parry one of your normals, just not even on, on wake up, but if you're just like back here and you just stick out a normal and it just randomly gets perfect parried because they were just randomly fishing with a parry expecting you to press some limb and they get it. They can put you back in the corner. And and now, I mean, Ken is fine because he has, you know, an invincible level 1 that side switches, which is fantastic for him. He has jump EX Tatsu, which can help him get out of the corner. He has side switches off of everything, which is great for him. And, um... And, uh... Yeah. And he has a DP and stuff. So... He's, you know, not worse... It's not worse for him to be put in the corner than it is for plenty of other characters in the cast. He has as many tools as you can reasonably be expected to have, uh, the way the game's mechanics work. But it's still, like, you're taking a gamble going on offense that something might go wrong, you might get put in the corner, and then if you guess wrong, it's a much worse situation for you. Luke does not have that as much by comparison, because... So here's the main difference, is that Luke does way, way, way more damage than Ken when you're in mid-screen. 
In fact, Luke is very bizarre in his design because he just flat out does more damage in mid-screen than he does in the corner. His corner damage is lower than his normal BNB damage because he can't get his wall bounce combos. So let me demonstrate. If uh, the opponent does like a uh, fucking, uh, let's just say drive rush. So that's 3,350 damage, and it's like half screen corner carry, uh, off of one medium button into drive rush buffered, right? 3,354 damage off of a medium button buffered into drive rush. Ken, by comparison, now here's one difference between the two characters is that Ken's good medium button for this sort of thing is he either has this, which is great, but is not special cancelable, it only goes into this target combo, so that's 1400 damage, or he has low forward drive rush, which is really strong, but the problem is that low forward scale combos heavier than Luke with his crouching medium punch. Low forwards just scale worse. So Ken can do this. 2100, 80 damage, so let's just say 2200. Usually the Ken player will do this, so 1800, let's just round that up and say 1900. Ken does 1900 damage off of a medium, off of one of his god buttons buffered in mid-screen. Luke does 3300, okay? So Luke just, now Ken can do like heavy punch, it's not a medium, but you know, let's say he gets stronger than low forward. So let's say he gets a, a heavy punch in mid-screen. He can get that. 2800, still not as good as Luke, and if Luke got Stand Fierce, he would get higher damage too. Uh, if the opponent was crouching, let's say, and Ken gets, uh, gets, uh, Stand Fierce, uh, he can get 2800. Not sure what the absolute most optimal routing is in this situation. Ken does have this nice ability to use his level- well, both characters do, actually. Can use their level 2 to kind of extend the corner carry a little bit and add- just get a better situation if they're almost taking the punch to the corner. Uh, Ken especially, if he's getting this, and he can side switch or whatever, or more- more- more usually if- is he's getting, like, this situation. Like, he's in the corner and he does low forward drive rush. And he pushes them this far out before he gets a side switch. He can dash forwards, but he's still out here versus, like... He can do level 2 and then push significantly back into the corner. But anyways, yeah. Um, Ken's infamous, like, whatever loops... Still not going to be doing as much damage as Luke, for the same resources. And like, most Ken players are not doing optimal stuff most of the time. See, here's the thing. Luke damage is actually pretty easy, and this is also a big uh, a strength to the Luke as a character, is that it's very easy to know what, what your combo routing is, right? If you land... Crouch strong on a counter hit or higher, you go into fucking uh, background house. I think you can get it off of low forward too, I forget. No, it has to be punish counter with low forward. Into whatever. Uh, okay, I should point out one weakness for Luke, and this is absolutely a weakness. His execution is... Both characters kind of have instances in their game plans, instances in their combos, where they have somewhat difficult... I say difficult, but I should just say, like, inconsistent execution. Luke Luke absolutely relies on getting that perfect medium knuckle off of Crouch Fierce. And you will constantly see even the best Luke players in the world accidentally drop this. And it hugely damages him as a character if they only get that, or if they do this on block. Right, by overcharging it. 
So, that's a weakness for the character, is that it's just unique, like, harder to be consistent with his combos all the time. Ken ha just has, like, his Jinrai stuff in the corner, which can be slightly difficult to time, but for the most part, um, it, that doesn't ha come up as often, as frequently as Luke's, and it's not as detrimental for Ken if you drop that part of the combo uh, with him in the corner. And Ken can just substitute most of his combos for slightly easier combos, or sorry, significantly easier combos that do slightly less damage. Whereas Luke, you need to be getting that Crouch Fierce into, into perfect medium knuckle. Absolutely a requirement for you to open up his the strength of his character. But here's the thing about Ken that makes him slightly more difficult, is that your combo routing to get your optimal damage is really fucking weird and inconsistent. Luke, very simple, you just land heavy punch, you go for back roundhouse a bunch, that's it. It's very simple, and anything else you do crouch strong, uh, crouch fierce. Ken, it constantly depends on what starter you hit them with, and... Okay, like, let's just say, uh, low forward, like, low forward, um, drive rush, right? So that does, uh, 2118. That does 2180 when I remove this, when I remove the crouch jab. But let's say we want to combo into level one, right? We have, like, not that much drive rush left, and we have a level one. So common sense would say we do that, right? Then that does 25-47. However... This specific situation, that does 25-77, so that's more. That... Does 26-28, so even more. That is like 50 more. Now, you would never think to route your combo in this way, normally, like how is that the most optimal, but in this particular situation, the scaling and the sequence of buttons just works out that that is the most optimal with that low forward drive rush when you have one bar of super. When you get in the corner, it gets more complicated. So let's say you land low forward drive rush here, what is your optimal conversion? So common sense, let's just say, do the typical whatever, into uppercut. So that is 22-44. Let's say we do that. 23-25. Let's do that. 24-47. Even more. Let's try doing the harder version of that. Less. 2309, less damage. So it seems like the most optimal off of just low forward drive rush is that. Let's say you get a counter hit. And the opponent's caught crouching. Only on counter hit off of low forward and the opponent's caught crouching. You can convert into the fucking stand fierce into the the crouch loops, but is that actually more optimal? That's less. That's less. Let's say we want to go into level one again, okay? So that does 27.06. That does more. So in this instance, it's better to do the harder version of the heavy Jinrai combo because it sets us up so that would be the best. Now let's consider, let's try testing the, the crouch, the crouch, um, fucking... Dragon Lash kick routes. 
and see if any of those are better. I already forget how much damage we just did with that combo. So like 2,900. How about level 2? Does it work the same way for level 2? Or do we have to have completely different fucking routing if we're going into level 2 instead of level 1? Let's figure it out. So for level 1, the optimal routing was... So, 3377, that's our benchmark. So, here's the thing. So, if we do just this... Going into the harder, more complex Heavy Jinrai route is less damage. That's 2300 versus... If we just go into the immediate follow-up and then the late DP, that's 2447, so over 100 extra damage. However, if we're on Punish Counter from Stan Fierce, and we follow the same logic, that's uh, 3070 versus that, 3220. So it's the opposite, where that one is more damage now. So, no fucking Ken player on Earth is doing optimal combos, even half of the hits that they land, because it is so weird and granular and that every fucking combination of resources spent on a particular combo and what you started with and whatever, uh, complete, the, ch the scaling is very inconsistent, very fucking random, and, and, um, people are constantly not landing the optimal combos with Ken, because it is just so weird to know exactly what the routing is to get your most to juice all your damage out of your hits with this weird ass character. No Ken player is doing optimal combos all the time, or even half the time. Whereas Luke, very easy to know what your combo routing is. You just do this over and over. Now, in some ways, you could say that that's a point for Ken because if people are already dominating everything, not even doing his optimal combos, it means he has even more to work with uh, once they, once every single situation is actually optimized and the weird routing that makes it most optimal. Um, or you could say that that's a point in Luke's favor that it's easier to play him and easier because that is a big challenge throughout this entire game with any character, you, no matter who you play, is knowing knowing your routing all the time and knowing when to spend resources there's every fucking match is going to have instances where it's like oh you could have killed if you spent all your drive gauge off on that hit in this particular way you missed an opportunity whatever it is very difficult in this game to know like your resource management and know your combo routing and when you have enough to kill and what's going on so for that, I think that's a point in Luke's favor. It's so fucking easy to know his combo routing. Here's a situation where the routing for level 1 is different than level 2. So, as we already established, level 1 routing in this instance is doing that. However, if we do that with level 2, it only does uh, 29, 22 versus uh, if we do That, 29.54 versus if we do that, 30.27, even though it has worse scaling by that point. Because this move, doing this move in combos, like, increases, does more damage than this kick but increases the scaling, but it just happens to cross the threshold of level 2 scaling where it goes down from 42% to 40%, which is barely any difference. Like, okay, in theory, let's say you do Driver Stand Fierce is your meteor, whatever. What potential reward are you looking for? Well, let's say you want to do, you want to try to kill with your level 1. How much damage do you do? Most people would just default to doing this. Then level 1, right? This does 3270. You can do that.
for 3 4 40. Level 2. You can do what? 3 5 8 5 versus. Three nine three zero. Oh. We're talking hundreds of damage, like three hundred damage. How about just a normal combo? Okay, what are your combo options? Most people would do. That's for that. Like okay, pure damage. You would do this for three thousand. Gonna go for corner carry. You do that for two two for twenty two hundred. You can some do somewhere in the middle with the run DP for 2740. But that is not your most optimal damage without doing the side switch. You can do this for 2870. If you land a, a jump in, what are your combos? Well, you can do that for 3070 let's say uh, spending two or three bars so you can do this you do crouch fierce so 3280 or let's do the side switch to pump the maximum damage 3341 You can do that for 3460. But if you just commit to doing your Crouch Fierce into the Heavy Jinrai right away and then you do your EX, 3700 for less meter. But, anyways, back to the characters. Um, like I said, one. I, in some ways, like, I, I think Ken is slightly more gambly than Luke, because even though this situation is very, is gambly, it, obviously in his favor, this situation is horrible to be in, um, getting fucking throw looped by Ken in the corner, but, like, let me demonstrate, like, the difference here. So, Luke, he has a couple frame kill things he can do to get, like, a meaty, he can get, like, a meaty, um, crouch yet, but off of his forward throw, what is his meaty? He gets that. Which can only go into... Uh... That. So, 1460 damage meterless. Which is nothing. Or he can go for jab target combo or some, like, commitment thing. He can try to manually time a meaty stand heavy kick for more for more optimization. But it's not a precise frame kill, so So you're really rolling the dice on that. Alternatively, if he spins meter. He has a great, like, just two-bar combo with this in the corner. Very, like, solid, respectable damage you can get from it. So that's, uh, 3,100 for, uh, two bars. He can also go for this forward heavy punch, which, as a meaty, will get more reward than just doing crouch strong. But, um... As a meaty, it gets like uh, 2360 meterless, which is okay. But on block, it's kind of weird in that um, this first hit is not special cancelable and it's minus 3 on block, and you can go into the next hits, but it's not actually a frame trap. It has a 5 frame gap, so it'll trade with 5 framers, lose to 4 framers. So, yeah, anyways, the, the point is that he can go for this, and he can just single, he doesn't have to commit to it. This is another thing that is single hit confirm rule from him. He can see the hit and then go into the follow up. But the point is that he either has to commit to doing something that's technically fake. You can totally interrupt between with a four framer, or um, 
Yeah, so you just do a minus three move on block and uh, hope for a hit confirm, and it doesn't leave him in a great position afterwards. Of course, he can drive rush to get a meaty, and that'll drastically increase his meaty damage, but that's true for most of the cast. So yeah, the throw loop situation generally depends on, like, throw is usually consistent for all characters that have a throw loop. So it's the meaty, the threat of the meaty of getting hit for pressing a button or for trying to jump out or backdash, and the threat of the shimmy. Now, most characters, their shimmy damage extremely high in this game. So if he goes for a, a throw and then he does like a, he does like a shimmy or whatever, he walks back. He hits Stan Fierce, he does this. Meterless, you're looking at 2,900. Um, since he's not right in your face, it's not as easy for him to shimmy with neutral jump, but let's say he can. Uh, 3380 for the shimmy. Not including meter expenditures, although he doesn't get that much more reward from spending meter, except for doing, again, just fucking drive rush into that over and over. Ken, on the other hand, his, um, meaty... So, see, that's the thing, is that Luke can do dangerous meaties, but he constantly has to spend meter. That's why you always see Luke players, like, running out of meter, because they're very thirsty. Because for him to directly threaten you in the corner, his confirmable, like, meterless options suck. It's much easier for him to just do fucking heavy punch drive rush, and whether or not it, it was hit or on block. So that's what they're constantly running out of meter. Is that in any offensive situation, his confirmable meaties, not fucking amazing. Ken, on the other hand, has great meterless stuff. Even just, even just, like, from lights. Like, Luke doing, um, like, a couple of lights into a conversion is, like... This is so piddly that nobody ever wants to do it. And, in fact, Luke players... Luke players hate doing this as a knockdown so much, they will accidentally make a mistake and, like, burn themselves out going for, going for some other option because they just fucking hate only getting this much damage and it's not even, like, a fantastic knockdown unless you spend Drive Rush, like, most knockdowns. But anyways... So that does 1,300 damage, almost nothing, whereas Ken, what he gets for like a light meaty situation or whatever, with heavy DP, um, 70, so let's say 1,800. So like a 500 damage difference, 500, half of a thousand damage difference, meterless, just because heavy DP, heavy sure you can hit so much harder than Luke's, um, Luke's light confirm, light knockdown. So any situation where you're getting like little confirms or anything, the damage and and um, just everything that it gets off of just heavy DP is uh, is a big factor in making him really strong. Because he has again his ability to just do things meterlessly is very very strong and get respectable damage meterlessly. He can even kind of go for like extended meaties and weird run overhead stuff so like a luke player feels so bad about the little fucking 1300 damage that they get that every time they land like a light neutral they're going to extend it for dry rush you don't see ken players doing unless it's going to kill you don't see ken players constantly confirming their their lights into drive rush just to get like a better situation better knockdown because they're, they're satisfied with that heavy DP, and why shouldn't they be? Now, in the, his corner throw loop situation, this is exacerbated even further. Because he can, there's a multitude of meaty options that he can get. Some of them have to be manually timed, whatever. I don't play Ken, so I'm not used to manually timing these. So he can get that. So, off of a meaty... So, uh, what was Luke's? Respectably, like, let's say Luke did his, uh... Crouch strong for his plus on block, it was like what? I think 1700, something around there. Meaty, meterless, 
2840. Twenty six twenty. Twenty three hundred. Twenty four eighty. And uh, and then his shimmy damage if he gets a neutral jump. Like thirty five forty. Thirty five ninety. Or if he walks backwards. Thirty two twenty. Meterless, all meterless. Also, this is another this is another little situation, but Ken has like the highest fucking DI wall damage in the entire game. I you know, sometimes you know, it depends on how much resources each character spends or whatever, but just one DI on block, wall splat in the corner, Ken has the highest damage. So we have like two, four, four or something for Ken, and if we go to Luke, two, two, which is pretty good for meterless. Let's not let's not shake a stick at, but it's like two hundred and fifty lower than Ken's, and he doesn't have great ways of extending it with meter. Except for shit like that if he's going into super. So that's like, uh, that's a lot of, a lot of the breakdown of the situation. Going back to their, their neutral and their footsies. I think that, um, Luke has a much better dry rush. His dry rush four framer is better. It reaches slightly further, it has a better hurt box. It's more plus than Ken's stand light punch. His drive rush, crouch strong, ridiculous. Six frame, great range, plus the drive rush, great hurt box. Wins very easily, extremely plus on hit, on block, etc. He doesn't do these to get into throw range, he does these to just like... It's like an augment of just his normals, you know? These are just his normals that control space really well and move him in. So these supplement his ability to rush down. See, I actually think Luke can rush down, like, get in on the opponent easier than Ken can, because, one, because he has the god move of Drive Rush Suppressor, which is just fucking busted. At stopping all checks ever of Drive Rush but also because he has these two buttons that are so dominant in the space, plus when it's augmented with Drive Rush. <clears throat> he can win neutral situations in footsies or just condition the opponent to not press buttons, and then he can just keep running in for... Either, do mo either keep running in for a throw, keep running in further before he does the crouch strong, or just do... <clears throat> One of the moves that actually does put him in range for throw, like Stand Strong, which is only plus one, but it is in throw range. Or Towards Towards Fierce, which will put him in, in throw range from fucking anywhere. In addition to that, he has a better drive rush stop his momentum with fireball, and more importantly, he has a better drive rush stop his momentum with heavy knuckle. I think that Okay, here's the thing, is that, like, one thing that I haven't talked about as much is that Ken's ability to not need to spend meter in landing powerful combos, he has much better meterless conversions in all sorts of situations, but he can also just pressure the opponent without meter. Not only because of his ability to confirm things from quite far away, his stand fierce, single hit confirmable, stand medium kick, single hit confirmable, 
Jinrai, he can easily confirm if the opponent's standing into a knockdown. He has a lot of counter hits like uh, this hit, the low hit of the Jinrai on counter hit or step kick on counter hit, meterless conversions. So he doesn't have to constantly spend meter to look for his hits, confirm his hits. This on punish counter on whiff punish just automatically combos. So that's, but also just his ability to have so many different ways of applying pressure without having to spend meter. Like, he doesn't have to keep the pressure up by, oh, they blocked all my strings, I need to get back in and keep them guessing. I need to do button drive rush button into fucking throw again. He, Ken does not have to do that. Yes, he has drive rush jab, which is very strong in this space, but he has lots of ways of, like, meterless or very low meter ways of keeping up the pressure. He has, he has Heavy Dragon Lash that he can do raw or canceled from other things. He has Run Overhead. He has Jinrai, which any of the follow-ups and shenanigans he can do. It doesn't matter if he opens you up or not with it. The important thing is that he's keeping you dealing with bullshit while not spending meter, and every hit that he connects on hit or on block, he's building back Drive Gauge. He has so many ways to just keep you locked down or try to open you up or convert or do anything without needing to spend meter, which means that he has such a battery to build meter back while applying his offense that then he has tons of meter to... that then he has more meter to spend to do the same shit that everyone else does, just harder. So he can still do all those same things with a greater degree of frequency because he, he has such reliable ways of building all his drive gauge back. So he has meterless ways, plus he can do all the meter ways even fucking more frequently. And all this, all this means that it's interesting because I don't know if I would consider Ken to be a more gambly character than Luke because his game plan relies more heavily on putting the opponent in the corner and going for Oki and stuff. Because I think that Luke gambles has slightly less control over his drive gauge than Ken does. Because Ken, Ken, Ken can play without playing drive gauge. Luke's neutral hinges on his ability to have three bars available so that he can do crouch, he can interrupt your forward movement or your drive rush or your buttons with crouch strong drive rush. So he needs to have that meter available. You watch fucking Chris Wong and Valmaster play in um, Winner's Finals of uh, the, uh, whatever they were at. And you watch them play, neither one of them is willing to do anything until they have max meter. Because Valmaster is like, okay, I'll hang out, I'll maybe throw some fireballs, I'll maybe do a low forward or a jab or something with Chun-Li. And he waits until he has like five, five and a half or six bars of drive gauge, and then he'll do some sort of movement and do, and do low forward drive rush. He'll go for one immediate throw or like a medium punch block string and then he'll back off, wait for his meter to be back until he's come to, because he's not comfortable dropping his meter lower to that and he's not comfortable doing a less reliable way to get in than just doing button drive rush. So very risk averse from both players. They both basically played the same way throughout the last couple of games of that set. And it's like, in some ways it's a hindrance because like when you play slow, to build back your drive gauge or whatever, you're also letting the opponent build back their drive gauge, you know? So in, in some ways it's like, let's say, um, right, I hit my, I hit my uh, low forward or I, I hit my whatever, get the drive gauge conversion, and then I do like a meaty fireball or something and then I go back to neutral, but I still haven't recovered all that drive gauge. It is recovering and it can recover very fast so long as I'm not made to go on the defense. And, uh, or have to react to stuff, or whiffing parries on, on bad fucking JP ghosts or whatever, but the point is, is that when your game plan relies on you being able to spend at a moment's notice on, on a buffer for a drive, a drive rush, then is it necessarily better to not be aggressive? Because if you're not aggressive... See, here's the thing. 
going for Oki in this game is a gamble. It's a risk. It's unreliable. But is playing in neutral not also a gamble? See, that's the thing, is that, like, you're also gambling that you can stop all your opponent's fucking driver. Let's say it's Luke versus Luke. If you don't go for a uh, uh, knockdown pressure, if you don't go for fucking, like overspend and spend down to two or one of your bars just to keep up the pressure and keep opening them up just kill 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 if you're not doing that and you instead you're just like taking like very light pressure and then going back to neutral are you confident that you can stop your opponent from lasering th lasering you from getting you with dry brush suppressor from just using all this degenerate shit that they will use to get in the Chris Wong Valmaster match is very interesting because it's two people who are very respectful of each other, and it's like whatever they whatever they lose or whatever they risk by spending the three bars to do a drive rush buffer or on block as Valmaster did most of the time. Whatever risk they take in putting themselves at three bars or lower doesn't matter if their opponent is respecting them and wait and allowing them to wait for their drive gauge to recover. So, it begs the question, what is overall stronger in this game? And, like, the idea of what is quote-unquote stronger is difficult because, like... <sighs> because, like, something can be really strong in that it's very... It's easy to lose against, but it's not necessarily, like, completely reliable. Like, if, um... If Mika in um, base Street Fighter V and vanilla Street Fighter V, if you just guess wrong to death with Mika, because she just um, has like full mid screen strike throw vortex, strike command throw vortex over and over, and you just die to that, it's very strong, but I don't know if necessarily Mika was considered the most reliable character in the game. It is definitely very strong, and it's very oppressive, and it sucks, and it, like, kills people very easily, and it's easy to lose to. But is it the most consistent? And what what does consistency in this game look like? Does it look like Ken throw-looping you fucking seven times in a row? Or does it look like Luke not taking his Oki and just hanging out and doing fireball and Crouch Strong buffered into a fucking drive rush? Which is more reliable? Which is more consistent? Which is e which is easier to win with? Which is like, because if you pl if you take the easy path, which in my opinion I would say like picking Ken and just any random hit you just buffer in a drive rush, you're instantly in the corner and you can just guess the opponent's death. In in my mind, I see that as like the easier way to win. It requires less effort from you. You just kind of do things and the opponent dies at your feet. Whereas, like, if you're playing, like, this Chris Wong or Valmaster style where you're taking knockdown, doing very light pressure afterwards, not overspending on your meter, not putting yourself at, like, two bars or lower most of the time, uh, unless, like, you're pushed to when the clock's getting lower or in certain situations, but... When you're very conservative, both situationally and in terms of your resources and having plenty left over, um, are you putting yourself in a, a harder position, like a more challenging position where you are in some ways safer because you're not taking the risks of getting perfect parry back thrown into the corner, you're not taking these risks, and you're playing neutral, but like... That you have to be very confident in your ability to control neutral in order for that to be, like, the safer route to pick, you know? You have to be very confident in your ability to check those drive rushes, to fucking anti-air, to, to beat those, like, DIs or fraudulent, to, to level one all of those fireballs. You have to be very confident in your neutral, and in that way, you risk your own ability as a player. Like, you risk making a mistake... In both ways, you risk making a mistake. If you're in, if you have the opponent in the corner and you miss a meaty, like I said, you can die from that if the opponent does a wake up button. But you are risking the limits of your own ability, punishing you for your decision making, or the potential of what you could have gotten had you been more aggressive with taking stronger Oki, more corner carry, spending more meter, going all in on your meter. It's interesting because. There's a lot of... 
the drive gauge and the actual situations are very incomparable in this game. There's a lot of instances where situationally a player is not taking that much risk, but there's overspending on drive gauge, and if one thing went wrong, like if if I like do an EX and then I do like whatever low four drive rush, if that gets blocked and then it gets like drive reversaled by like a, say a Blanker, someone that gets good Oki after the drive reversal. So a Blanca drive reversals that and then runs up on me and then fucking does like stand fierce into his level two into lightning beast and then does like some block string that like eats away the remaining one one bar of my drive gauge or just generally puts me in a situation where I have to make guesses to save my drive gauge that I don't want to be making. You know, there's a lot of situations where people spend and then sometimes everything works out for them they're on, and they just build their meter back almost immediately and it's completely fine and sometimes the situation does not work out for them and whatever meter they spent suddenly comes back to haunt them in a big way and possibly over a long period of time especially if they get burnt out so it's hard to measure risk in this game with the existence of drive gauge and the way it works and so between these two characters it's difficult to say which one of their play styles is riskier or not. Do I think Luke risks more in terms of his drive gauge management? Do I think Ken risks more in how much his game plan relies on really oppressive Oki and um, risking getting fucking cornered by a bad, by things getting turned on their head as they often do in this game? Uh, while you're pressuring the opponent. Do I think Luke's neutral is strong enough or superior enough or reliable enough that it negates that... Like, is it like copium to think that going back to neutral is somehow more safe and less risk-averse or more risk-averse than fucking going for Oki just because of the existence of jump and perfect parry and level threes working the way they do and things like that? I don't know, but um, in terms of just the damage output, very simple way to look at it. Um, Luke probably slightly more controlling neutral. I think in terms of matchup spread, he has more... His tools fit more situations easier. Like, I do think this EX Fireball from Luke is better as an anti-zoning tool than Ken's EX Fireball, even if Ken gets more reward when his works out for him. I think nothing can compare to Luke's level 1 in terms of the sheer control he gets in certain matchups. And um, I think Luke's dominance with this range, not even getting into throw range, but just this range of doing Drive Rush, Crouch Strong, Drive Rush, Crouch Jab, and um, plus Fireball, Plus his ridiculous jump fierce, etc. Um, they, 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 they. I think his matchup spread makes is more solid. And um, but that being said, I think it also depends on like how what decisions you make with the character. Like I said, Luke literally does more damage in mid screen than he does in the corner. So should you even be cornering the opponent at all with Luke? I actually don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Um, but yes, like, the fact that Luke does literal, like, almost twice as much damage for the same amount of resources spent with his combos in mid-screen as, as compared to Ken, I think is, like, a huge factor. It's very easy to get, like, throw loop to death by Ken and then say, this situation is fucked. And it is. It absolutely is. That situation is fucked and stupid and unfair and ridiculous. And the fact that any time he touches you, he puts you in that situation is very, like, debilitating. But every single one of those throws that he... Every single one of those situations is, like... Every single one of those things that looks so oppressive and is so oppressive and works out for him is a situation where he could have fucking died. And that's not necessarily as much the case for Luke. Like, Luke's really strong stuff is not... are not situations where if the opponent had made the correct read, um, he could have suffered greatly for it. 
So, I... But then again, I, I just don't know, because some of these things are difficult to measure. So, you know, it's easy to talk in abstracts without looking at the exact fucking data points. Um, do I think loot Ken is generally easier to play? And thus, Ken is, um... And thus, it's easier... And that is a legitimate factor that matters. Like, being able to play a character that has a very simple, easy game plan and win condition, and you don't have to worry about that many fucking tools or anything, uh, does matter, and it makes it, it makes it easy to play him, and if it's easy to play someone, and they're strong, then it's very easy to win with someone. Um... So, yeah, these are all, you know, psychological factors, mental stack factors, uh, they do matter, and, uh, I don't know. I mean, I would rather fight a Luke than a Ken. I certainly would, but I don't know which one is stronger. Um, in some ways, I'm leaning towards Luke. See, the other thing is that, like, when you return to neutral, or just any of the time, you know, just because you are playing risk-averse, you're playing in a non gambly way, doesn't mean that your opponent will be playing in a non gambly way. And if you're not gambling, and your opponent is gambling, and they're forcing you into gambles where you have to guess, either in the neutral or on offense or defense, then... 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 then does the argument still work, you know? Does the... Can you control whether or not you play risk averse if the opponent forces you to, uh... forces you to make guess for your life like an asshole?